not. Welcome to the Rise Network podcast show, a podcast dedicated to help you reach your dream lifestyle through investing in real estate. We're going to be sitting down with new, intermediate, and experienced investors to talk all about real estate and how it has changed their lives. If you're looking to scale your portfolio or even just get into real estate investing, you're in the right place. Make sure to tune in. Hello, everyone. You are listening to the Rise Real Estate Investing Podcast with your host, Austin Ye. And by you. What's going on, everyone? Austin, we got to change up that intro. Maybe I'll say is my Is my mic sounding better? Can you notice it? I you, know. You, yeah. And you're super loud. Am now. I too loud? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cause I got a new mic, like a very dope one. And it's probably a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, and now I have a very loud voice. So I'm like, now I'm just concerned that I'm blowing everyone's ear jumps out. So the audio quality is going to be even worse. We'll see. Let's see how it is. Awesome, man. How's the last week been going on with you? What's new? What's changing? Uh, yeah, over the last week, things have been going uh, pretty well. So our acquisitions, people on our team are pretty much in full force. Sent out tons of mailers for them. They're going to tons of different walkthroughs face to face. Have a couple of deals that we have locked up that we will be emailing out. We have a deal that's active right now in Angus, which is like couple minutes drive from um, Barry, so not too far there. Uh, but yeah, we have a lot of pr- we have a lot of exciting things in the pipeline from a deal perspective and just as a wholesaling company as a whole. Um, yesterday, I went out for a networking event, not a networking event, like I guess like a mini get together um, with Aaron Bay, uh, his wife, Ariana, um, Waylon, Jason Lau, who we never had on this podcast before, but I don't think he has any interest in being in this podcast, to be honest. Like he likes to keep low key. And uh, Michael, Mike, Mike Lee, 416 home buyer. Yeah. So we're just chatting and I got to check out Jason's fourplex that he built um, in Toronto. And that was pretty cool. Like after seeing that, it gives me kind of the urge to try to do something in Toronto like that. But I do understand that he has a very um, like specific skill set to be able to to do these things like development projects and also you need a fucking shit ton of capital, which I just don't have that capacity to build out a fourplex in Toronto. I'm sure you could, but there's opportunity cost to everything, right? So it's just, you have, I don't know, man. He was yeah. like, it's like, ah, oh, I'm all in 1.8 million. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> you could raise that. If you <laughs> want to. Uh, yeah. Because I don't know if I have the skill set to go. No, no. But the thing is the numbers work because it's not raised capital. Oh, okay, this is okay. legit like funding in cash and a lender financing. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. How about you, man? Um, last week was, I don't even know what the heck we did in last week. I think it was last week when we went to the network event. No, that was the week before. Um, I looked at a, the, a fourplex. Um, so that one was interesting. Don't think I'm going to be going forward with it, but um, it, it's, I spent a lot of time. So I think I got to put in some systems to like avoid going out to these different places because that's probably what eats up a lot of my week on like certain, like whenever I have something that I got to go check out, it's like a couple hours each way. Right. Um, other than that mortgage business is going good. I think, um, it, it's interesting. Like it seems like buyer demand is kind of slowing down, but people are getting some fucking good deals. Like someone, one of my clients bought a bungalow in Scarborough for like 900 grand. And I was like, shit, this is dope. Like, why don't I have this The corner unit bungalow that you can easily convert into like two or three units, depending on how you structure it. Right. Um, it's crazy. Like you end up being a part of the acquisition process for a lot of these deals and it's actually super fun, but, um, the mortgage business is going good, man. I am starting to look for another flip because we're wrapping up our, our other one, probably in the next two or three weeks. Um, me and my wife are actually talking a lot more about going into the Airbnb business model. Um, so looking at one of my units is becoming vacant in Toronto. So I'm probably going to convert that into, but it's a basement unit that's becoming vacant. So it's not ideal, but it's at least something where like the top floor covers majority of the rent, like the fixed costs, right? So the basement is just really the cash flow that I'm going to hopefully make into an Airbnb. And then um, we're also planning to house hack uh, our principal residence when that closes in January, make that into an Airbnb and then kind of blow out that business model. So um, really just looking for an active way for my wife to kind of be in the real estate space. She's not into like this entire like burying and like renovating and like all that kind of stuff, but hospitality, making places pretty, like that's yeah. kind of her thing, right? So nice. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to handle the renos and she's going to handle everything staging and, and going forward, talking to the, I, not tenants, I guess in this case, they are your tenants, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, go for it. No, I was just going to say, yeah, like the communicating piece is like, it, it, it takes a lot of time, but it's a, it's a business model where you could 
bring in other people and hire and, and outsource as needed as well, right? Uh, which is yeah, that's with any business model. Ultimately, yeah. it's it's just a matter of first like proving the concept. I'm I, I'm a believer of doing things lean at the beginning, proving the concept yourself, and then figuring out where it makes sense to hire and yep. where it makes sense to pay higher wages because this is an important task. So when you outsource it, you don't want to cheap out on things like that. Um, yeah. But that's awesome, man. A lot of people are moving towards the Airbnb model uh, more and more. And even I've been uh, kind of thinking about it as well. I'm thinking about turning our Sudbury six units, some of those units into Airbnbs just to see how it's like and how much more money I can generate doing so. Yeah, I think I think the I think a balanced approach is the right way, right? And, and so there, there's different types of indi- individuals. Some people want to be like an expert in a niche, which is really good, right? Like, cause you could go full blown into Airbnb, you could blow it up, you could do like what Aaron, Aaron Bay is doing where like they're experts in that space. But I think for anyone that has a sizable real estate portfolio, a good composition would encompass some short-term rentals and medium or, or furnished rentals, right? I think it just amplifies your cash flow a little bit. It's a little bit of a different business model that you can kind of easily incorporate without building out a whole crazy business that supports it, right? Uh, so that's really my goal. Like, I don't think I'm going to do like 30, 40 units on Airbnb. It's just more so like if I could have like four or five units on Airbnb yeah. running, like producing like a little bit more cash flow than normal, like I'd be pretty happy with that, right? Um, totally makes sense. Yeah. That's kind of a good entryway into our, our podcast today with James. We, we kind of spoke about a whole bunch of things. We started off, I think, um, speaking a little bit more about an earlier investor's journey, right? Like how we all started with like single family houses, duplexes, triplexes. James went on to like buy a 30, uh, I think he said 33 unit. 33 unit. Yeah. A 33 apartment unit building for $5 million, which he's planning for a lift in value of about $2 million on that. Um, we talked a little bit about multifamily cap rates and valuations. Um, and then we really ended off talking about um, the different journeys that a lot of like real estate investors like take, right? So, so we all started, I, I still remember seeing like Aaron Bay's name. I remember seeing James. I remember seeing like all these like different investors, like Janaid, like all, all these guys, Ishan said, um, we were all starting basically doing very similar stuff, right? Where it's like, okay, buy a single family, duplex, triplex, right? Do this, whatever. Um, and then eventually we all like, majority of us have quit our job or are going to be quitting our job if they haven't already. Right. Um, and everyone went into kind of different business models and, and specialties. Right. So uh, I think it was a great podcast episode for anyone that's, you know, early on in the journey, looking to see what the potential is. Um, hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Make sure you guys comment and subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend if you found it useful. Hello, everyone. We are joined with our very special guest, James Fernandez. James, how's everything going, man? It's going fantastic. I had a little bit of a wild ride uh, recently, but um, I can't complain. I love I love going through these crazy properties. And um, some of you had seen uh, the Instagram stories with uh, what I'm calling the machete house. Um, Yeah, that was whack. Was there actually like was there actually like some sort of like gang fight there? Like what the fuck happened there? Not not a gang fight, but uh, Basically, uh, I'll send you the article later if you'd like, but basically a couple of the tenants that were living there, um, they got into an altercation. And uh, that was a lot of blood. That was a lot. lot. I've never seen anything like that before, man. Um, And uh, like, I guess, fortunately or unfortunately, um, my fiance uh, walked through there with me. So she had a really good time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's hilarious that's your first building too right so what an what an experience so so her first her first yeah like that one's not at the apartment um that one's at a different like oh, random that- single family home uh, gotcha. but uh yeah it was uh like she she was i think uh, a pretty good sport about it overall but um definitely not what i imagined i'd be walking her through um, yeah. when i went in there 100 so. percent. my wife would just be- She'd kill me. She'd be like, the fuck did you get me into? Like, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. All right, James, before, before you go into your current issues or, or, you know, problems and profits kind of situations, um, why don't you tell everyone a little bit, a quick background on yourself, like how you got started in real estate, when you got started, because I don't, I don't actually know that, um, sure. what you're up to today. Sure. Um, so how I got started, um, I wanted to buy a Tesla and I didn't want to pay for it myself. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I ended up moving out of my mom's basement, uh, into a property that I could rent out uh, a portion of. And, um, yeah, the, the rental income paid for the car payment. So that was kind of how I got started. 
after that, uh, like several years later, I guess, I went to OREC uh, 2019. Uh, Matt McKeever, Jeff Weibold hosted that. And uh, there I learned about something called the Burr strategy. And uh, I also learned about Airbnb. So um, that's basically uh, kind of where I got like going on real estate stuff. So that was like, uh, yeah, late, late 2019. I started renovating my basement apartment uh, where previously that, that person was living who was paying that uh, car payment. Um, and I trying to make it like nicer so that I could burn the property. And then I also started an Airbnb uh, where I was just collecting cash um, basically on the other half of the property. So after I burned that property and was able to pull out like over hundred K um, I was just like, why the hell am I not doing this more? We didn't learn about this in school. We didn't learn about this, like just talking to my friend circle at the point. So then I just wanted to do it again and again and again. And um, yeah, that's kind of what I did. That's where we are today. So that's awesome, man. Like you immediately took action after going to the Oruk event, right? Yeah. Like you, you immediately set up an Airbnb like, shortly after that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Oruk was the 27th, 28th of April, uh, 2019. On the uh, 1st of May, I already had the booking up. And then on the Thursday, so following, I had someone booked in for Friday, but I didn't have like plates and cutlery and blankets and towels or anything like that yet. I just, um, I literally just put like my house on Airbnb and I took my clothes and I threw it in the basement and that's it. So I was very unprepared <laughs> and then they were coming on Friday. So like I spent literally all of Thursday night at Costco, at Walmart, at whatever, just like getting all the stuff together. And I'm messaging the guests. I'm like, you're my first guest. Like, please just help me out. <laughs> like, if you need anything, tell me. <laughs> Cause I have no idea. I was like, single guy i had one plate one fork one cup <laughs> one spoon you know like i didn't have anything else so uh yeah i got i got some more uh like a family's worth of uh, like stuff so it was good yeah so, so you started off with the airbnb um and then you did a burr um yeah. and, and where'd you go from there like what was so this was 2019 timeline right so yeah uh, it's been a couple years from there so so where'd you go from there and by the yeah, way this is all so, in london ontario i assume right that's right. Yeah. Okay. So I live in London still. I'm actually in like right now I'm living in that basement apartment that, that I renovated. Um, and the upstairs is still an Airbnb. Um, so yeah, I'm still like what kind of where it started. It's a little one bedroom basement apartment here. And, um, yeah, so I took that, re uh, that refi money and I bought kind of a, a my first crack house <laughs> that was February 18th, 2020. Um, rented that using lines of credit and credit cards and, uh, hopes and prayers basically. Um, way over budget on Renault's, like, and everything went wrong on that thing. It got broken into every, like all the shit, the whole basement ended up needing to be torn out because of mold and no vapor barrier, all this other stuff, man, I learned a lot there, but, um, yeah, that, that place I bought for 220, uh, February, 2020. Um, and I just sold it actually this year to the tenants privately oh. for 510 and they, oh, whoa, whoa. Uh, you bought it for 220 it. and you sold it for 510. How much work did you put into it? I know you said it was a big project. Yeah. Yeah, it was about 120 K okay. and then I got about 10 K in rebates and stuff like that. So about 110 K in, uh, in rentals. Wow. That's phenomenal. So, and this how many was also, was that? sorry. Yeah, that's a, that's a duplex. And, okay. uh, I refied nice. it last, uh, July as well, or June. Um, so I, I bought it for 220, put in 120, let's just call it and, uh, refied it for 400. So, so what was, the, it was a zero, zero burn. What was the decision to sell instead of just burning it again to pull out money? Because you said that you sold yep. for 510. So assuming you yep. could have appraised and refi at 510. Absolutely. So I was actually appraised at like 550. Um, I, I had to make a, I had to make a decision. Do I want to refi at 550 with like a 20 bucks in cash flow, or do I want to sell it and pull out that 200 grand and buy an apartment building? Mm. That yeah. was the decision. Does the $20 in cash flow change my life or does moving um, a 5 million a dollar position to $7 million position changed my life. And that, that was the decision. Um, I never thought I'd sell it. Uh, it wasn't necessarily an easy decision to sell it, but um, when it came to like actually making the decision on where I want my life to go, uh, I decided for me, it was not going to be collecting duplexes. It was going to be something else. 
So let's go into that, right? Because because James is, uh, I mean, done quite a bit since what we're talking about in 2019 and 2020. But even if you were to sell that that 550 property, if you'd already refinanced it at about 400, you're yep. pulling out an, another. Like if you were to sell it, you'd get another. I don't know, make your numbers here, but like 150, 200 k or something like that. It was 200 k that I pulled out of there um, to deploy onto the apartment. Yeah. Yeah. So then that would put you at a cap of about like 1 million, right? Like if, if we're assuming that you're not really like raising any more capital, you're just going to redeploy the same existing capital. Just that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then for 1 million in, in London, you know, like London's a pretty expensive market. How an much of an apartment apartment's definitely going to be more than a million. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it was a $5 million apartment that you bought. Yeah. Before we build into that, like I want to go into kind of what else you've done in, in the sure. interim. Uh, because I know that you made that apartment building jump pretty spontaneous, not spontaneous. Actually, yeah, I would argue pretty spontaneously. <laughs> you kind of just took action on it. So in between making that decision to get an apartment, what else were you doing on the side? Like just sure. buying other duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes? That's, that's right. Yeah. So I um, I did that. I bought um, one of a triplex. I bought a couple fourplexes uh, with Jeremy Ivany. Um, I bought uh, a bunch of stuff in London and in Sarnia with Nina Gurgis. Like those are, those are other projects that were kind of in between and just burring as fast as possible to, to accumulate as fast as possible, raising money where needed. Um, so that's, and renovating as fast as possible. That's basically speed is the critical thing. So by, I guess, end of 2020, um, I'd accumulated a bunch of units and turned over a bunch of units. I know people always talk about like, how quickly can I burr? Um, is it three months? Is it a year? Is it six months? There's no rules. Like, if you just make a good business case, you know this, you'll burr, you'll, you'll refi it. It's not an issue. So yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of it. And uh, then towards the end of 2020, like I was pretty tapped out in terms of um, bandwidth uh, mentally and, and physically and money and everything. And um, I, I started like learning, I guess, uh, how to raise capital in a different way that was much more effective, kind of changing my mindset around that where um, I'm providing a value, not not asking for money and that was a really really effective tool uh, or mindset switch uh, to create that tool and and yeah moving moving forward to the apartment just uh soliciting money from friends and family or accredited investors in a totally different way where needed and providing value yeah versus just asking for money so, so James, let's talk a little bit about the burnout, right? Cause I think in, in 2020, like you, you definitely like acquired a bunch of real estate. Awesome. Myself, we definitely acquired a bunch of real estate. Everyone, that was kind of like a year of growth for a lot of people. And I don't think that many people know the struggle, the pain, the shit that goes on behind the scenes the back end. Yeah. That's a complete fucking mess. Right. Oh so, my God, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about that, right? Like, well, what, what made you kind of make the switch? Like, what was the mindset that, um, you know, obviously like apartment buildings are great and we're going to talk about that. Right. But what is the, the main hurdles that you felt doing a lot of these small buildings? Um, the, the main thing for me was time just poor. Uh, I, I still working full time. Um, and we're on like mandatory overtime as well. So like 45 hours a week minimum, that's like kind of your commitment there. Um, and what did you do? I was an engineer uh, okay. it's in London, Ontario. There's a company here that I worked for. Uh, I was doing a bunch of different uh, roles there. I love my job and it was a great company to work for and I was making good money, but I had to choose um, where I wanted to deploy that time. And uh, yeah, towards the end of 2020, I had been for about at least three, four months, uh, getting about three to five hours of sleep a night, gained a bunch of weight, wasn't eating that healthy, like all this other stuff. And just realizing like, okay, well, I can trade my health for wealth right now, mm -hmm. but it is nearly impossible to trade all the money in the world back for help. Mm. You can't, um, there's, there's no magic for that yet. So yeah, that's when I started uh, rethinking what I wanted to actually do. And, uh, I know like there's a, there's a lot of people that talk about like the early retirement and, um, that that's not my vibe. Like, I don't, I don't see myself retiring. I don't see myself like whatever. I don't even, I don't even like that word. It pisses me off. Because I feel like a geriatric and like, basically I want a time freedom. That's what I want. Yeah. yeah. Here's the it's thing. Huge. Like if you're, if you're going on three to five hours of sleep every single day for a couple months, you're not all of a sudden going to go to, I'm going to do nothing every single day yeah. for the rest of my life. Like no, Hell fuck no. that. Right. And, and realistically, uh, those people who are getting early retirement, they are high performers. They're not, they're never going to retire early once they, yeah. once they yeah. hit the financial freedom number. Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, I didn't, I didn't even uh, like think about that or advertise that or anything like that. It wasn't about that for me. It was about, I know I'm going to work still like 20 hours a day, but I'm going to choose where those hours are allocated and how, how I allocate them um, with a hundred percent direction from me. So that was the main goal that I wanted. Um, It wasn't about working less or like going on vacation all the time and like turning into clouds all day or whatever else. It's just like, Oh no, I want to be able to direct my time. It's like what 10 in the morning on a, like a Tuesday here. And we're able to have this conversation. Like, that's what I want to do. I want to go, let's go, let's go get some lunch. You know, let's go walk through some crack house in the middle of the day. Fine. Go. And there's for sure, there's for sure some days that you just don't work. Right. And it's just like, it's Hell deliberate, yeah. right? Like nothing is like, no one's making me do whatever I want. Like I can yeah. work on a Saturday instead of a Tuesday. I'm like, that's my choice. Right. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. That's and exactly so, it. Just that full freedom. Yeah. So, so time freedom is a big part of it, um, I guess. Right. And so, so what else kind of led you to making that decision? Like, um, did you just find like it was harder to manage all these like small properties? Absolutely. Or- I was falling behind, man. I was so falling behind on some of the stuff. Like at one point at 25 units under renovation in three different cities. And it was just like, wow. what the hell am I doing? Like, I can't keep up. I'm falling behind. Things are going over on cost. Things are taking longer than they should. I was just, just failing. It was, it was too much. So I had to like really make a decision on how I wanted to proceed on this. And, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where that came from. I think a lot of the, the issues at that point where you're scaling can be in theory, um, mitigated by essentially just hiring people, right? The problem is that real estate is, or real estate long-term rentals is a business where there's not that much cash flow for us to be yeah, hiring yeah. people. We're making wealth on paper and like, yeah. no real like money, right? Like in our pockets. Yeah, we- as- I was talking to <laughs> talking to Mina about that. He's like, "How are we rich but poor? How yeah. the, <laughs> it's true, rich but poor. <laughs> like um the the that's that's kind of the the funny part of all this. Where um I see all these news articles, all these like the greedy landlords, rents too high, and all this stuff. I'm like, dude, I make eight dollars off of you. Like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I don't even know. What you're, like, where are you yeah. getting these things? So um I I do I do hope that um people realize, uh, I guess in the rental market, the, the true cost of uh, real estate. And I, I do see rents coming up to match that right now, slowly. I, I've actually at that one of the units even had like bidding wars on rent uh, yeah. for, for applications and stuff, which I'd never seen before. I don't know what your guys thoughts are on that, but I don't, I don't really like subscribe to the bidding wars on, on that type of thing. Like uh, I set the rent at what I think is good enough. And, um, I, I kind of do a lottery system from there. And the reason for that is the the tenant that's paying $2,000 for a $1,500 unit is going to be a high maintenance fucking tenant. Like I don't want to deal with that shit. So yeah. if the rent's 1500 bucks, uh, plus utilities, uh, and I get like a bunch of applications, like let's just call it a thousand applications or some ridiculous thing. Okay. I, I know I'm underpriced then. So the, the rent is now $1,600. And now let's just say I got 200 applicants. That's a decent pool to work from. And from there, narrow it down to the, like the top 10 and do your full due diligence. And out of the 10, I draw, draw one type of thing in, in that scenario. Uh, yeah. And then that tenant's super happy to have gotten a deal. So Yeah, totally yeah. agree with you. Price isn't always the most impa- important factor. And I think a lot of new investors don't realize that when someone is willing to pay higher rent, there's trade off for that, right? It could just be because they're not getting any other rental units because other landlords are turning yeah. them down. Their credit score is bad. They have to compensate by paying more rent. Um, so you bought up a very important point there. Uh, kind of want to move forward from that. So uh, you bought a bunch of properties, right? You you were burning it hard to to manage and keep up. And then you recently quit your job not too long ago, just a couple months ago. We we're actually on the phone prior to that decision. Yeah. Took a action a lot, a lot quicker. So kudos to you. And obviously <laughs> that paid off. Um, so now that you quit your job, what has your day to day been looking like? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll just note that Austin said I couldn't be on this podcast until I left my job. So <laughs> that was, uh, that was my main motivation, Austin. So um, there you go. Changing lives what, everywhere. Uh, that's what you're on. <laughs> um, my normal day to day, um, I'm, I'm usually up quite late. Um, that's just who I am as a person. I, I get a lot done between 12 and three. That's just like 90% of my work. I'd say like deep focus work or 
just like things that I need to think about, uh, that's when it gets done. Um, I am trying to sleep earlier and, and, and wake up earlier, uh, just because that's how normal society, uh, <laughs> works. Um, but, uh, yeah, for the most part, uh, my normal day, wake up around eight 30, do some quick uh, emails, texts, whatever came up like from, from the night before. And then uh, just checking, like I have a separate email address for every property. So checking through all of that stuff in the morning. And then at night again, I do that. Then during the day, it's uh, phone calls with uh, investors who are in, interested in investing with myself. Uh, investors who are already investing and I just want to talk to them or learn from them or something like that. Um, deal uh, analysis uh, a little bit here and there. Um, that's like kind of just chill for me while while I'm just eating or something. I just I'm analyzing deals. It's just what uh, what it is for me. Um, and then uh, running around and checking on the projects uh, is usually a typical afternoon. So right now that, that apartment is really nice because I have 10 units under renovation, but I park once and I walk through. It takes me an hour to yeah. check on 10 units rather than, oh, I'm going to drive to Sarnia, I'm going to drive to Chatham, I'm going to drive to Windsor, I'm going to drive to London, I'm going to drive, like, you know, um, to check the same 10 units. Mm -hmm. So instead of a full day, it's taking me an hour to do 10 units. And uh, yeah, just refining my systems. Like, I'm not, I feel like um, when I was starting, I was looking at people who were doing what I'm doing now and being like, oh my God, they have all their shit together, like all their systems. I have no systems, blah, blah, blah. Like, Honestly, like I still feel that way. Like I still feel like I don't have systems, even though I like I'm fairly hands off now. Um, like I, I sold all my tools to force myself to not do this shit. All I have is a Dewalt Impact driver and like some drill bits, and that's like all I have left. Um, but for for the people that are watching, they're starting off and be like, "Oh my god! Like, how did he do it? Uh, what are his systems? Where like th these questions don't actually get you anywhere." Don't for, don't worry about that shit. Just do it, and you'll figure it out. And just keep figuring it out as you go. <laughs> like don't yeah, don't think too far ahead because you'll talk yourself out of anything. Exactly, and you really don't know what systems to build and sell until you put yeah. yourself in the fire. Like everyone yeah. talks about, oh, like we should do this, we should do that. When you actually get involved in doing real estate, you realize, oh, there's all of these small knit like small tiny things that I could outsource, right? It's hard to Absolutely. really determine what to systemize until you've done a couple of projects yourself. Have you Absolutely. hired anyone um, since? I know there was a virtual assistant in play. Yeah. What are they yeah. helping you with? And are you looking to hire anyone else? Yeah, so um, Chris Lean's my virtual assistant. She's been absolutely fantastic handling all my social media and a bunch of basically whatever tasks I throw to her. She's uh, really like you can if you scroll through my Instagram, it's actually hilarious because you can see the day she started. <laughs> because <laughs> all my shit's so <laughs> ugly and then her stuff is beautiful like curated really well and everything like that so she does all my video editing photo editing um posts like that um she's created back-end stuff for me like uh, google forms for tenant applications investor nice. applications my website running and management she does all that i don't have her do any of the bookkeeping or banking or anything like that um i i, I like that stuff i like seeing the, the money flow um and like People, people get really anxious about like tracking receipts and stuff. I use Google Drive and I like doing it. So that's not an issue for me there. Uh, what else? Do I, uh, I don't know, just random, random stuff that comes up. Uh, it's like, hey, for can you handle this? And um, I just pass it on that way. So she works about 40 hours a week or so. And I'd say the value is absolutely there. Uh, really helpful. Other people that I've hired, um, I have like semi full-time um, like handymen, two or three of them kind of on the go running around property managers for the stuff out of town, but I still manage the stuff in town or my Airbnbs, like the cleaners, they just are linked up to my calendar and know when to go, what, what to do. And like, I just follow up with them every now and then for receipts and supplies. And if they need to restock or if we need to fix anything, that type of stuff. Otherwise then the contractors just having a good contractor team, but I like, I'd say like, I'm still general contractor, sort of, I pay all the subs directly and i pay for materials uh directly but um yeah having that kind of that kind of stuff like there's definitely ways to outsource more of what i'm doing and um i know i will do that going forward but at the point i'm at right now i don't want to basically so like for for this apartment like there's a there's a property manager i'll bring on uh eventually they'll be doing like uh, cash for key stuff and um, just managing the regular tenant stuff as the day-to-day -day goes. But right in the high turnover stage um, and 
all these units under Renault, I, I haven't hired that out yet. And I just, I want to be there because it's worth literally everything I have to be there. So I think the best, like you realize what we can outsource out of like pain, like painful moments, right? Where it's like, fuck, I have to do like a million things. I sh- really yeah. shouldn't be doing that. And then you start outsourcing. And it's so much about like along the way, right? So like so many people, especially in the coaching world, they go like, oh, like what, like, what system should we implement? Like, yeah. oh, and I'm like, honestly, everyone's needs is going to be completely different. Cause like you yeah. like doing bookkeeping. I fucking hate that shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was exactly. in Canada before, but I still hate that shit. So it's like exactly. everyone's needs are going to be completely different. And like type of real estate that you own is different from what I own and different yeah. from what Austin owns. Right. So it's all kind of like very situation specific. And I think um, those For systems sure. emerge over time. Right. So, so James, let's talk a little bit uh, more about kind of you going into the apartment building space, right? Cause I, I mean, at that point you're, you're pretty proficient with single family duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. I'm sure like it's yeah. just like kind of cookie cutter stuff that, you know, at, at, at a certain point, your eyes are closed. You're like, yeah, then I'm, those numbers works. I know exactly how much it's going to cost in rent. Exactly, There's nothing yeah. else to it. Right. Um, how do you make the switch from that into the bigger multifamily and like talk, talk us through that. Yeah. Um, honestly, it was just a decision too. Uh, that was it. It was, I'm going to do this. And, um, it was, it was the, my whole life is kind of like this. So I know it sounds stupid, but I'm like very, very lucky. The decision to buy an apartment building was very random. Uh, but it came from, I joined a, a coach, uh, Alfonso Cuadra. So I joined that group, Dave Shapiro, a good friend of mine had uh, recommended I check him out. And I was just randomly like messaging people on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and, and his name came up, uh, Alfonso's name came up like five, six times separately, independently. I was like, all right, you know what? I, I, I got to check this guy out. And I'm not really uh, one to like pay for coaching or anything like that because there's so many resources on the internet. So I was like, why would I pay or, you know, that type of mentality in general? Um, same for OREC. Like I didn't even want to go, even though the ticket was like $250 and it changed my life forever. But I didn't want to pay that. Like I just, <laughs> I just figured like, oh, it's on the internet for free. But yeah, like with this, it's curated for you. So it's a totally different way of, uh, of seeing that information that's, that's available, right? So um, anyway, after talking to Alfonso and seeing like kind of what, what he's doing and what his students are doing, I was like, well, I've done like kind of the same or more than some of these guys in a, in a different way, like on duplexes and triplexes. Like I've got like 60 units renovated. Like I know enough to renovate the stuff. Like why am I, why am I doing them one at a time? Why don't I do them all at, at the same time? Like, in the same space instead of driving around from city to city and then like kind of having like Alfonso here as my, as my coach, I'm like, you know what, if I fuck something up, he'll be right there to like kind of help me. I'll figure it out. So on, on like a Tuesday, a random meetup that we had in London here, I mentioned to uh, a guy also in the same group, Franklin, I was like, Hey dude, like I want to buy an apartment building. Uh, He linked me up with his realtor and they brought me a deal like that, that day. Franklin and, and Jeff. And uh, I was like, uh, shit, like I was not ready for this <laughs> already, but a little bit like analyzing the deal and like going through it and stuff. Um, it was like all bachelors, no parking kind of shitty. I didn't, I, I just said like, this doesn't make any money. There's like subsidized housing program for another 25 years here. And I'm, I'm not interested in this kind of thing, but what I want three story walk up flat roof. I don't care. Um, no elevator. Uh, I don't care if it's shitty. I don't care if it's half baked. I want lots of parking though. And I wanted to be in like a decent part of town. That's why I told that realtor. And like literally the next day, he's like, Hey, you want to go for a walkthrough on uh, another one that I found? Wow. I'm like, what, what the heck? So, so, so and in one day, <laughs> well, exci- I just want to ask you a quick question. There. So when you're going apartment hunting, because obviously the, the supply of apartments is a lot lower than the supply of like single family. Duplex, oh, right? hell yeah. In Ontario. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then are you geographically saying I want an apartment in London? Or are you saying I want a three-story apartment, flat roof, parking, whatever, a good part of town, but yeah, I, I have a bigger geographic like horizon? I tried to I tried to niche down. So I was saying like London, Guelph, Ottawa, like those were kind of like the three I just chose. Ottawa, um, <laughs> yeah. like the opposite side of town. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, but those were like the the three I kind of just chose to like be specific on okay. because uh, like that's another I guess uh, thing for younger investors out there. Um, if you're too general, you're not memorable it's not useful uh, to just say, I want a duplex. So just fucking everyone else and their mom. Like it doesn't help <laughs> be more specific on like, I want, I don't know, uh, 1500 square foot, uh, high ceiling basement. Doesn't have to be a walkout or, or big windows. I'll take care of that. Um, I just want like 1500 square feet, 
nice tall basement. I can take care of the rest. Uh, this part of town, 500 grand. Like, I don't know. I'm making up shit right now, but yeah. just be like more specific. So when someone sees that, they think of, oh, it's my, my wants that one versus duplex. Okay, there's a thousand duplex money. Why aren't you looking this up? You know, like they don't, they don't think of you like that. So that's, that's, that's kind of where that came from. I was just like trying to be specific, but it ended up, <laughs> I didn't realize it was going to work like that, where I was like on Wednesday talking on, and on Thursday, we we're walking through. And then uh, Thursday night, we put in the offer and, and Thursday night it was accepted. So like, fuck me, I have an apartment <laughs> building now. How many people did so, you compete with on that uh, deal? And it was uh, off market, man. It was off market. Okay. So only yeah. very, very few people walked through that property. I don't know how many people walk through, but I just, I can tell you that uh, the owner was there when I walked through, not that I talked to him or not that he would even give me the time of the day because who the hell am I at that point? But I walked through uh, with Jeff and Franklin, put in an offer that night and uh, it got accepted that night. <laughs> so, was there yeah. any particular strategy that you used to make the offer stronger? So in like, you know, duplexes, triplexes, like, I'll go clean. Um, I'll put a bigger deposit. Obviously, like with the $5 million yeah. purchase price, you can't afford to put no, no, a no. million dollar deposit or anything. No, like no, that. no, no, hell no. So um, there's a, there's a strategy I always use. I gave him his asking price. I didn't, I, I actually gave him $1 more than his asking price. And that was the same. Like, You're generous. I know <laughs> I am the generous guy. So um, it wasn't about the the price because he was asking at 150 a unit, which is pretty normal in London um, at the time. Pretty good. Yeah. He was getting good value and uh, so was I. Um, because there's room to grow in that building. But I, I decided instead of negotiating a price, I'd negotiate on terms. So I focused on vacancies. I focused on um, like flexibility in terms of access and other types of things like that. I ended up getting 10 vacancies on closing. So 30% of the building. How many roughly, units was this? 33. 33? Wow, okay. That's good size. And then uh, a few other vacancies coming up soon through... Uh, and fours and fives, that type of thing that are in process and, and hearings and uh, like orders that are already in process. So it should, should have another three or four vacancies coming up soon. Um, but that was like my main area of focus because each vacancy is worth 200 plus thousand dollars in terms of cap rate and refi. Yeah. So, so they were that under market value, like $700 to $800 wow. average market rent for a two bedroom in London, Ontario. Wow. And what does that it, rent for? 15, 1600? Yeah, about 16. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so a lot of upside. There, there's a lot of upside there. There's some value there. Um, I just uh, realized our guests might not actually know why there's so much upside in what we're talking about. I don't know if we've oh, ever yeah, talked yeah, about enough. multifamily valuation. So do I just let's, quickly... Uh, yeah, let's go into that. It's, it's fantastic. So this is kind of the other reason that I was pushing um, so aggressively into the space because um, in the single family, multifamily, uh, small multifamily stuff, you're looking at comparisons, right? Your neighbor's house sold for 500 grand, so your house is probably going to get 500, maybe 520 if you added like something really fancy with like a Japanese toilet or something. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, in the multifamily space, you're looking at value. Um, if you can create more revenue, you look at something called a capitalization rate. And basically, that rate is how effectively your building turns money into more money. So banks or appraisers typically assign a cap rate to an area. That's like kind of generally how it works. Um, I'm not an expert on this, but this is basically what I've seen. So in my area, it was roughly 4.25% cap rate for that building. Wow. And so I'm buying at a 4.25% cap rate. And basically how to calculate that cap rate um, you can get your net operating income, which is your income minus expenses, not including the mortgage, just the operating stuff on the property, like utilities, taxes, whatever else. And you divide that net operating income by that value that, or the purchase price or the value of the building. And you'll typically get like 5%, 4%, 7% in some markets, that type of thing. And so if, if for, for those out there listening, like that's kind of what a cap rate tells you. It's how effectively this purchase price of the building turns that into money. And I was just going to add on to your example. So you said 1600 was the market rent, uh, market rent and it was renting at, yeah. I don't know, 800 bucks. That's, that's $800 right. in additional net operating income a month. Times that that's by right. 12, that's 9.6K extra net operating income a month. Let's use the 4% cap rate, right? Divide the 9.6K by 4%. 
that's 240k added to the value of your property from um, one unit from one yeah, unit. One unit. yeah yeah which is crazy which is crazy and I, I think the other i think for people to understand like the multifamily space basically what's happening is like a fourplex will have another fourplex down the road a single family house will have another single family down the road there's easy comparables right but when you get into a 33 unit building like what james bought Good luck trying to find another exactly 33 unit building with the same number of bedrooms, same parking, same whatever, right? Like it's just yeah. not possible. So the way that appraisers value it is very similar to how a business is valued, right? Where yeah. it's what is my net income? And then that's going to directly derive the valuation of the property, right? Um, so that's it's right. very similar to how like all businesses have always traded and how companies should be valued, right? Based on net income and then a multiplier, which is basically the same as a cap rate um, yeah. to drive the end value, right? So uh, that's why a lot of us like, we eventually like realize there's so much more potential and economy there is, yeah. and there's so much, it's just so much easier in the multifamily space to make generational wealth. Right. I really want to touch on something important that you said there that the building is valued like a business yeah. and you qualify like a business because James Fernandez, uh, the net worth that I have and my like credit score is kind of the only two things I was really asked about personally, everything else was the business, which is the building. How does the business run? How do you run a business? That was all the focus when I was qualifying for this mortgage. That's a critical differentiation from smaller multifamily and single family homes that I think people who haven't thought to venture into this larger space haven't addressed. You don't qualify in the same way. You're not capped out based on your personal income. You treat it as a business and you qualify as such. So um, that's uh, one point that I wanted to touch on there. And the other point was when you when you're in a duplex or fourplex or whatever and you add a dishwasher, let's just say, and you get an extra fifty dollars a month in rent, it's pretty typical. So that's another six hundred dollars a year. But in the apartment space, you take that six hundred dollars a year and you divide that by four percent. And Austin, you had your calculator handy, right? Or maybe you're just uh twenty four thousand twenty four thousand yeah. at a five cap or a four cap or something like that, right? So your six hundred dollar yeah. dishwasher is now increased the value of your building by like hundred eighty K. Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> you said, uh, six, did you say 60 bucks? How much was it? $50, 600 bucks. Oh, yeah, I said 600. 600. Oh, 600 a year. 600 a year. Time, oh, okay, I thought it was a month. 4%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So that's uh, 15K. Yeah, yeah so $15,000 dishwasher uh, value add there. But I guarantee you, if you add a dishwasher in a fourplex, it's not going up 15K. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. That's kind of okay. the value there. And that, that I, I'm hoping that whoever's listening to this right now and is like, I'm just going to buy another duplex, um, but has the means or, or ever thought about like owning something bigger, just fucking go for it. Like it is definitely intimidating, scary and whatever else you want to call it. But the only thing that's probably stopping you from doing that is just fear. And like, it's still scary. Burn rate on this building is, is ridiculous. The amount that's of money going out the door. That's um, exactly what I was going to ask you. Cause if you've got 10 out of 30 units vacant and then you've got, a, a bunch of other units that are in the N4 process, like whatever, like LTV stuff. Hell yeah. Um, you must be burning money. <laughs> yeah, dude. So like plus renovations, right? Yeah. Plus all the other carrying costs and everything like that. So that's built in. Like every project I've ever done is like this, where I just burn a pile of money at the front and make it on the back. But it's scary. Like it's, it's so super, super intimidating when it, it like, for example, some of these numbers are just like, they just scare the shit out of me. The land transfer tax on closing was $100,000. The property tax a year is $45,000. Insurance is 15 k Like these, these numbers aren't numbers I was used to where like I pay $2,000 a year on a fourplex in Chatham, you know, like it's for insurance. It's not like, what the hell is this $45,000 shit? There's one other thing that I just want to quickly add in here, right? Cause I, when I talk to newer investors that want to jump into multifamily, I also tell them that like you went through the process, right? Like you did single families, duplexes, triplexes. So you knew your renovations, you had an idea of property management yeah. insurance. Like you, you kind of knew all that stuff, right? But had you jumped right into this 33 unit building and you were off, let's say on your estimate of what your insurance cost is going to be, mm -hmm. that error is also magnified, Absolutely. right? So like it's while the building is that 4% dividing, right? So yeah, exactly. So like if you had budgeted $10,000 and then your insurance comes in at $15,000, I don't even know my mental math. I think that's the two yeah. two hundred thousand dollar error in your valuation. Yeah. So right? this, so. Is the, this is the critical part on the APS at the start, where I had uh, like a forty five day conditional period, and you you really have to do your due diligence. Again, like I didn't really know what I was doing, 
So I leaned heavily on my network of people around me to try and help me figure out what I actually needed to do. Even just closing costs before I bought the building was $10,000 on the appraisal, the inspection, the baseline condition property assessment, like all the, all the due diligence involved in that. And you might not even buy the building after spending that $10,000, right? So it's a, uh, it's a risk for sure. How I mitigated those risks uh, were using other information from the, the seller. So as an example, I had a phase one from the seller that was done in 2016. And for, for those that don't know, a phase one is an environmental assessment of the property to check if there's like oil or gas leaks or like all this other weird things that might cause health issues with people. It's, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Typically lenders will ask you to do phase one. If you go to phase two, yeah, but, dude, like the, the cost from phase one is like, I don't know, three grand. The phase two is like 10 and remediation could be 30, 50, 100. You have mm-hmm. no idea to fix all that. So you, you really got to do your due diligence because uh, that could really cost money. The appraisal, again, like typical appraisal on a home, 500 bucks, you know, appraisal here, 2,500 bucks. An inspection, uh, again, like you do a home inspection, 500 bucks here, 2,500 bucks. So you're the baseline. <laughs> yeah. Takes them, uh, takes them a whole day. It's like 400 page report, yeah. right? And um, yeah, and then the baseline property condition assessment, BPCA, basically tells you like your roof is going to fail in 10 years. Your cameras are like 15 years old and they're zero K. So you should probably upgrade them. Your water heater has this much life. And it tells you like kind of over time how you can project your CapEx. So you can kind of save money like that. Kind of interesting uh, way to do that. So let's talk about the capital side, right? Because so to get into these bigger, like truly bigger apartment buildings, because I'm still staying like under 10 units, right? And for me to jump to like a 30 unit is going to mean a significant amount of capital outlay on the, on the even like pre-buy, right? Because I yeah. like, likely you're going to be making an offer on like four or five of these apartment buildings before something sticks, right? So you're, you're going to be burning money. You got to be okay with that. But then it's also when you're buying $5 million, I don't know what kind of loan to value you ended up at, but you need a significant amount of capital. So are you funding yeah. this yourself? And then also for the burn rate, are you just raising everything up front? Are you using private capital, joint ventures? Like what's your route and what's the journey there? So yeah, that's, um, that's why I started selling some of the smaller stuff because it made sense too. And uh, like working with, uh, with Mina as well, like our plan was to sell some of the stuff that we had bought kind of all together as a portfolio, just because we had to. And then we were able to slowly like get rid of some of that stuff that we didn't care as much about and keep the stuff that we wanted. So when that, that's kind of where a lot of the capital came from, uh, a lot, another large portion of the capital came from private debt. So uh, carrying prom notes, or carrying second position mortgages or cross collateralizing stuff to increase my loan to value. That's kind of the only way I could make it happen. I actually, like I ran into so many roadblocks and um, like whoever like is, is kind of really scared to get into this apartment building space. Don't even talk to me because it's <laughs> so scary. There's so, there's so much that will scare you away from doing it. You can talk yourself out of doing almost anything. And man, if you told me like all this stuff that, I had to go through to get to the point of close, not even like the reno yet. If you told me like right at the start, this is what's going to happen. I wouldn't have done it. Mm. It was so much. It was a lot of work, man. And um, it was very intimidating. And I lost like 15 K on a deposit for one of the lenders that I ended up dropping. There's just like stuff like that, that just keep, kept coming up. And it was, it was so scary. But the only thing really in my head was, I'm just going to make this happen no matter what it's going to happen. So. so let me ask you this hypothetical situation. If someone, cause like so many people in Toronto, right? You've got a house that you bought like five years ago and you've got 500 K in capital. Is that enough to jump into an apartment building or oh, yeah. do you suggest? Yeah. Dude. So my mentor, uh, Alfonso, he's, he's typically buying apartments with none of his own money. Yeah. So there's ways to syndicate mortgages. There's ways to portion out equity on a joint venture agreement. There's ways to set up corps that share uh, with uh, preferred shares. So you just raise money from investors. What's her name? Investor girl, Brit, Brittany Arns, Arnerson or Ar- Arnson. Yeah. Um, you, you know who she is. She's like the long hair, does her all DIY stuff. She's awesome. But like, that's where she moved from, from doing her like, I'm going to buy a $30,000 home in like Saskatchewan, middle of nowhere, and then sell it for a hundred. 
she bought like a 400 unit storage thing with investors. And like, that's the, that's the next the step of the goal is, um, all right, well, I can buy this whole apartment building by myself, 30 units. But what if I buy a thousand units with 15 people? What if, mm-hmm. um, what if I buy a hundred units with two? What if I buy, like, you know, it's still, the proportions are still like kind of the same. I'm still getting, oh, another 30 units in my name. Um, but that 30 units is part of 150 units as an example. So that, that's like kind of what I'm thinking about as I go forward, how to do this with none of my own money. Because if they can do it, we can do it, man. There's nothing stopping us from doing any of that stuff. So that's kind of it. Yeah, I totally agree. A lot of that is definitely a mindset shift. Even you talk smaller scale. If you talk to someone who's never been in real estate and you talk about your first property, which for most people, the first property was a lot of headache and it's usually a single family duplex. That scares someone, yeah. uh, someone from doing that. And even as an intermediate investor, like when you start getting to the advanced level and you hear advanced people's journeys and their headaches, you're like, oh shit, do I really want to go down that path? But ultimately it's all about like taking action, right? And there are a lot of people in the real estate network that I guess um, I've kind of grown up with. We kind of got started around the same time. So yourself, uh, Ishan and Sid, who are doing amazing things now as well. They're doing a development on their, I think it was five unit. Um, Five unit, yep. Yeah. And that inspires me, right? Because we all started around the same time. Like, we oh man, like pushing each other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, now these guys are taking on bigger projects. Like I like, what am I doing now? Right? Like I should just, I yeah. should just take the plunge at this point. And then I, I speak yeah. to you guys, you know, like, fuck it. We just did it. It's not like we spent months and months researching. We just, you don't know what you're doing most action. of the time, right? You, you'll figure it out as you go. Um, it is a bit of a double-edged sword though, because like, uh, I know Kellen's talked about this a lot where uh, there's like that fear of missing out or like, am I good enough uh, to keep up or do I need to keep up or anything like that? I don't know. I, I feel like that's kind of a, a broken mindset where like, if you want to do it, the people that you're watching will motivate you, not make you jealous. You'll feel that jealousy if you don't want to do it. That's absolutely correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and then when if you're that person that's feeling jealous about someone's journey right now, honestly, it's like take a second and think about why the fuck you're here. Is it just for money? There's other ways to make money. You don't have to do this shit. Like, I don't know. I, that's that's just my perspective on on that. Like from what I've seen, the people that that get really jealous about this stuff, they oh, don't. Oh, it's totally. Want it's to a dick measuring that. contest now in real estate. Right? <laughs> like that's exactly what it is now. Everyone talks about unit counts, this, that, so on, so forth. But what's yeah. your goals, right? Like that's all yeah. it comes down to. What's your goals? And like, why are you being jealous of someone else's journey to because their goals are different than different. yours, right? And exactly. That's, yeah. that's why, like, I don't mention like number of units or anything like that on my page because like, it's kind of a shitty metric a lot. Um, like, for example, I just gave you this 33 units and it's like, Austin, here's 33 units. And you're like, great, 33 units. Going to put it on my Instagram. Like, all right, but you have to support a $65,000 a month burn. What the fuck? Yeah. Why would you want those 33 units? That's stupid. That doesn't make yeah. sense. So you, like, if, if you have a thousand units and they make negative $1, you're an idiot. Yeah. Like, it's not, it's not the same. Like, you can't just put that and, and be like, I'm a genius of real estate. So I, I try to stay away from that. And, and it is like a vanity metric that really does attract viewers and followers and all this other stuff. But in and of itself, it doesn't mean anything. And, and for whoever's feeling like kind of left behind or jealous or whatever else, like forget about that shit, just focus on your shit. And it'll be much more productive if you just focus on your own thing. What I think is important is I think there's a lot of people that started very similarly, right? Like everyone starts with a single family duplex, like stupid, like small shit, right? Like it's all, yeah. everyone, we all start really the same way, but then everyone kind of goes into different branches within real estate, mm-hmm. right? Like you're exactly. going, I think, if I was to assume what your goal was, it would be to get into a hundred, 200 unit, like a large, large apartment buildings. You've got other investors that stick with like single family duplex triplex and they just do like a crazy amount of joint ventures. Right. And, yeah. and that's a great business model. There's obviously like wholesaling, there's Airbnb. There's so many different things that you can move yeah. into within real estate. It's just, I find it fascinating to see what everyone goes into and like what the results look like as well. Right. Cause yeah. everyone can take their own journey. And I think it's that's exactly it. Yeah. And that's what really interests me because, um, you can take little portions of other people's journeys and apply them to your own life. You don't have to do like, for example, uh, when I talk to uh, Aaron and Ariana, I love listening to well, his posts and talking to him and, and, her, and uh, Ariana as well. And um, when I see like their cash flow numbers and all this other stuff uh, that they talk about very regularly, they're very open with all their stuff. 
it's phenomenal. And I try to apply that knowledge to my very small Airbnb portfolio. Yeah. Do I have the goal of, of what they do? Uh, no, not even a little bit. But can I learn from that still and apply it to my business? Because all they're doing at the end of the day is running a business. Yeah. Can I apply that biz- business acumen to, to my business? Fuck yeah, I can. Can I, from you guys wholesaling and how you build your systems and communicate with people and um, can I apply some of that into a portion of what I'm doing? Absolutely. So like, I just try to, I don't know, everyone's got their own thing. Just try to learn from it and, and grow from it instead of being like, oh, well, I have to do that now in order to make money. I have to do this to make money. I have to do this to like, so that like my dick hangs out at the bottom of my shorts when I show up at this next real estate. <laughs> like it doesn't, it doesn't even matter. Like just do, do what you need to do. Focus on that. Yeah, no, that's absolutely <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah, ultimately, it's getting inspiration from people, not competing against other. There's like, I think yeah. when McKeever says it, there's enough money or something like that for everyone to win. So like, there's no, mindset, no right? Yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's all like mindset stuff, right? And so many people like it's very like small stuff, right? They'll be like, oh, like like what do you think about being a mortgage agent, right? I'm just like, man, like I don't know, man. You take your journey, you do what you want. If you're telling me that yeah. you're gonna be a mortgage agent as the only way to make money, like there's so <laughs> many different ways, and there's so many better ways to make a lot of money, right? Um, yeah. so I don't know, like, it's just, everyone kind of has to be on their own journey. James, I think this was a great episode. We went, I don't even know. We started on single families. <laughs> you went through apartment buildings and then we just talked about the real estate community as a whole. And like, you know, just kind of like challenging each other and, and growing up as a, as an entire group. Right. So I think this is a great episode, James. Generally, we like to ask our guests three, three kind of questions at the end as we sure. kind of wrap up our episode here. Um, so where are we going to be seeing you five years from now? What's your goal, personal business, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I don't actually, this kind of shitty, uh, I don't actually set any goals or anything like that. I just like kind of go with the flow as I, as I go through it. I just like doing it. Um, but realistically on uh, the real estate side, um, you can still see me probably uh, going through some apartments or crack houses or something. I, I like doing it. It's kind of funny um, finding all this uh, stuff. And on the the personal side, like I, I think like by then I'd probably be married with a kid or something. Um, I'd, I'd really like to do like homeschooling or I don't know how this, uh, this government's going to be working out for in our favor here in the next little bit. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, so in the next five or so years, that's kind of where I see myself. Awesome, man. And if you won $10 million, what would you do with it? And you cannot spend it all on real estate. Um, so he's probably going to buy a couple apartments if I no, 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 no. about that for a sec. I, have you guys been watching, um, Matt McKeever's Citadel stuff? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like I'd spend that $10 million on real estate granted, but like a castle or some cool, like cool, like Island or something like that where, um, yeah, we could like sustain our own stuff, grow our own food. Like I've always wanted to have like a hobby farm. My, my aunt is that, um, stay at home dadding with, uh, with my kids and just like cooking and eating all day. That sounds freaking fantastic. So it's James, that's kind of what... like a, um, <laughs> Cause I got like, I get what you're saying. So are you more of an introverted individual and would you rather live in a city or a rural area? I'm just curious now. This isn't one of our questions. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. So if there was good internet, yeah. I'd live anywhere. I don't care. I, I like, uh, I like traveling. I like nature and hiking and that type of stuff. But the only reason I'm in the city is because that those amenities aren't available mm. elsewhere. Yeah. Like that's uh yeah, but I, I like, I like that stuff. Um, I don't know. Like, no, like I, I, food and, I, I regularly say like, I'm like yeah. a farm guy. Like you put me on a farm with like no neighbors and like, that's my vibe. Like I just want to yeah. see people around me. My wife would go <laughs> crazy though. Cause she's a polar opposite. That's, that's the reason we live downtown. <laughs> yeah. Um, <fair> enough. <laughs> cool. James. So, so if you could have dinner with anyone dead or alive, who would you choose and why? Oh man. <clears throat> I should have prepared for this question. Um, yeah, I, I'd really like to to talk to Elon Musk. He's awkward as fuck to talk to. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think you can learn a lot just from how he makes decisions. That's the main thing. Like he, I, I really, I feel like I, I try to not do Elon Musk mistakes, but I love that at his level, he can make a $40 million mistake with a tweet, whatever, you know, SEC $40 million fine for tweeting 420 on, on social media. And just be fine with it. I want to be, I want to get to the point where I can make $40 million mistakes and just say, fuck it. Fuck you guys. Here you go. 40 million bucks. And I'm just going to move on with my life. And, um, even with this, so this $15,000 like deposit that I lost on, on a, a lender's, um, 
like uh, going from commitment letter or sorry, a uh, letter of intent to commitment letter. We can talk about that another time, but I, I was really bummed out about it. Um, but someone, another investor that I was talking to you about this, uh, she said, think about it as a speeding ticket. You're moving fast. You're going to break things. It's fine. Just think of it as a speeding ticket. What's that $15,000 going to be a year from now, six months from now, 10 years from now, forget about it. And like, that's why I'd really like to sit down and talk to him about like how he made some of those decisions. Um, because I feel like that's, uh, I don't, the, the achievements are fine, but you, the decision-making lines up to those achievements and thinking about like how he actually um, decided some of those big things, I think would be a really uh, impressive thing to learn. Yeah. I think you said something awesome there. Just talking about that $15,000 like deposit that you lost. Like it's not that we're not frugal to a certain extent, right? Like we obviously got to where we are by saving money. If we were just burning money out of our pockets every other day, like we, you know, it's, it's different. But I think yeah. as you start to do bigger and bigger things, the checks that you write and the money that you lose throughout the process are going to be bigger, right? Like yeah. we used to do like $300 appraisal or inspections. And it's like, whatever, like we're not going to make an offer, right? So you just burn $300, but it's a cost of doing yeah. business. Now you do like a thousand, two thousand dollar appraisal or inspection, sorry, and you're just like, I'm still not going to buy it. Like yeah. it's a sunk cost, right? So yeah, um, that's awesome, man. So just I don't know, like leveling up to a point where I can make a forty million dollar mistake and not like lose sleep over it. It just is a cost of doing business. Like that would be a really, really cool thing to get to, especially coming from uh, kind of nowhere, right? So yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate you having on, uh, be jumping on the podcast, James. Like, you're a wealth of knowledge. Uh, you're an inspiration. Seeing you grow in your journey has been absolutely phenomenal. And I oh, look, we need to have you back on because I'm very curious to see um, you turn around this 33 unit building. I know there's a lot more details that we chatted about offline that weren't necessarily covered here. There are a lot more hiccups and how you were able to pivot around them. But I think we can just do an entire episode. Uh, on that when all is said and done. Um, Sounds good. Again, man, you're doing fantastic things. Is there anything that uh, you, you want to add on before we wrap up? And is there any way people can reach out or contact you? Yeah. Um, to add on uh, for, for those that are maybe scared about getting even into their first deal, single family home duplex, whatever it is. We were all scared, man. Like we were all scared for this. Like there's always going to be something to talk you out of it. Just do your due diligence on the numbers. The numbers work through the deal. That's it. Um, yeah, you can reach out to me on uh, Instagram or Facebook. So Instagram is uh, at james.ferns. And uh, on Facebook, it's just James Fernandez. So you can find me there. Awesome, man. I uh, appreciate you jumping on. Make sure you guys like, sub, comment, do whatever you can to support this podcast because it helps bring awesome guests like James out here. We'll have you on again, my friend. And to everyone That's listening, um, invest smarter and live better.